Hi, I'm Richard Barr from Youngstown, Ohio, uh, professor of radiology at the Northeastern Ohio Medical College. Today I'd like to give you an overview of breast elastography um, as it is in 2012. Elastography is a new technique in ultrasound which can provide information which was previously not available. Elasticity imaging is based on tissue stiffness or hardness rather than on anatomy. Elastography has the potential to quantify the stiffness of a lesion which was previously judged only subjectively by physical exam. So breast elastography is really an imaging equivalent of a physical exam. There are two types of elastography presently available. These are strain or displacement or compression uh, elastography, which is based on tissue deformation from an external or patient source, and this is qualitative. The other technique is shear wave imaging, which applies a push pulse that results in a shear wave propagation that can be measured as a velocity, and this is a quantitative method. Uh, let me give you just a brief uh, physics of these two, uh, very simple. Um, in strain elastography, if we have a uh, jello phantom that has an almond within it, and we use a spoon to push on that, you can see that the jello changes shape, and we know from that that it's soft. However, if you look at the almond, as we press with the spoon, it doesn't change shape, and therefore it's hard. So the uh, strain algorithm uh, actually looks at frame-to-frame -frame changes in the software. Um, the algorithm actually varies by manufacturer, so you need to be aware of which system you're using because the amount of compression you need to do varies depending on uh, which manufacturer's equipment you have. Some require very minimal um, changes. Um, and actually just the patient's breathing is, is the actual appropriate um, amount to get good images where others require you to use your hand to cause some displacement to get uh, a reasonable amount of displacement for their images. And again, this is a, a qualitative and not a quantitative method. So we don't get an absolute value how stiff it is, but the images are uh, coded either in black and white or in color based on what is the hardest to the softest. So this does create a problem uh, in interpretation because if in, like in this case, uh, we have a, a breast image where uh, we've got a normal dense breast tissue as well as fat and muscle, um, fat shows up as being white or soft and, and for all my images I'm using white is soft and black is hard. But in this image on the right, you can see, which is almost all fatty tissue, that we do get some areas of fat that are black. And this is because we only have fat in this image and the algorithm forces uh, something to be the hardest in that image. And in this case, this is fat. So it's very important that you realize this and remember this when you're interpreting images. So to avoid interpretation images, it's really helpful if you increase your field of view as large as possible and always try to contain fat, fibroglandular tissue, pectoralis muscle, and the lesion. By doing this, you have fat as being the softest tissue and pectoralis muscle being the hardest tissue um, if there is no cancer. So this gives you a fat is white, fibroglandular tissue is uh, gray, and pectoralis muscle is black. If you have a cancer, the cancer will be the hardest in the lesion, and again, fat will show up as white, fibroglandular tissue will show up as gray, and the cancer will show up as black. Um, if you don't include pectoralis muscle, when you do this, you can get a situation where the fibroglandular tissue will look very black, and you may misinterpret that as being a cancer. Um, as long as you have a good B-mode image, one can perform uh, strain imaging. Depth is really not a problem. Um, malignant lesions in strain for breast only actually have a very unique characteristic, and that is that they appear larger on elastography while benign lesions appear smaller. So uh, we like to use the strain to B mode ratio, that is the length of the lesion on strain divided by the length of the lesion on B mode, to characterize lesions as benign or malignant. 
and we can do this with very high sensitivity and specificity, and we use a ratio of one as the uh, discriminating factor. So anything with a ratio of one or higher, we consider to be potentially malignant, uh, and anything with a ratio of less than one, we consider to be uh, most likely benign. So here's some examples. This is a six millimeter invasive ductal cancer, and you can see that it is about seven and a half millimeters on the elastography, giving us a ratio of greater than one. Again, predictive of a malignancy. And in this case, we've got a approximately one centimeter fibroadenoma, which on elastography decreases in size to 0.8. Again, a ratio of less than one, therefore felt to be benign. Um, and there's another scale, the Ueno scale, which has been uh, suggested using a color scheme where red is soft and blue is hard. Uh, you can classify the lesion similar to birads on a five-point scale. So one, the lesion is soft, uh, meaning it uh, is mostly um, green or red. The, uh, a two, the lesion has a mixed uh, soft and hard pattern. Three, the lesion is hard and appears smaller than on the B mode image. And here, the blue is meant to represent the image on the elastography, and the larger green circle is the uh, size on B mode imaging. Four, the lesion is hard and appears equal in size to B mode imaging. Five, the lesion is hard and appears larger than it does on B mode imaging. And then there's a BGR. Um, which uh, is seen in cysts where we have this uh, tri-layered uh, pattern, which is uh, seen in cysts. So, in a way, this is very similar to us using the um, strain to B-mode ratio in that we considered a 4 and 5 as being potentially malignant and a 1, 2, and 3 as being uh, benign. Uh, in a way, we can do a semi-quantitative uh, process to look at the strain data by looking at the ratio of the strain numbers for the lesion and versus fat. Um, this can give us a relative idea of how stiff a lesion is. Um, and here what we've done is we've got a lesion that's hard, being blue in this uh, color scheme, and we've got fat. And what we can do is place a uh, region of interest over the lesion as well as over fat and get the um, strain numbers for these two and then do the ratio. Um, this is not approved for use in the United States at this time, uh, but here you can see the ratio is 8.6. Um, so the cancer is 8.6 stiffer than fat. Um, early studies have shown that in a ratio of approximately 4.5 is the most likely cutoff between uh, benign and malignant lesions. Uh, we performed a multicenter trial uh, using strain elastography. It was done at six international sites. We enrolled 635 patients with an average age of 56. Uh, we had approximately 65% um, benign lesions and approximately 35% malignant lesions and uh, we chose all comers. Uh, these were all patients who were scheduled for an ultrasound guided biopsy, and as you can see, we have a, a normal distribution of pathology. Um, and um, our results are tabulated in this figure. N is the number of patients at that site. Uh, B is the number of lesions that were benign on pathology. B less than one is the number of these benign lesions that had a strain to B mode length ratio of less than one, and that gives us our specificity. M is the number of malignant lesions on pathology, and M greater than one is the number of the malignant lesions that had a um, strain to B mode ratio of equal to or greater than one. And as you can see, if we look at our sensitivity, uh, five of the six sites had a 100% sensitivity, so that the strain imaging was uh, very uh, good at predicting uh, malignancies. Uh, one site had a 97% uh, sensitivity, um, and when we look back at this, uh, we could see that one of these lesions was DCIS, and the lesion was not really well seen on B-mode imaging, 
And again, if you can't see these lesions well on either B mode or on the elastography to get a good ratio, we really shouldn't be using this uh, technique. Uh, the other, another one of those lesions turned out to be two lesions on uh, pathology and on B mode imaging it was interpreted as one lesion instead of two so uh, the lesion actually looked like it got smaller um, because the second lesion was benign and the third lesion the lesion actually got taller uh, but did not get wider and was considered to be benign. If we look at the specificities uh, they ranged from approximately 75 percent to 95 percent um, and I think we did this study actually several years ago and we've learned uh, how to improve the technique and I think that those centers that were getting lower specificities um, were using uh, a technique that could have been improved and I think now that we think that the specificity uh, is more in the range of uh, 85 to 90 percent. If we look at the um, strain to B mode ratios in benign lesions it ranged from 0.2 to 1.5 with an average of 0.76. The malignant lesions had a, a strain uh, ratio of uh, 0.9 to 3.1 with an average of 1.45. Um, and these levels uh, were uh, significantly different than each other uh, with a, a two-tail p-test of less than 0 0.001. This is the gauge plot of our data and you can see that um, all of the malignancies uh, except for a few, had a ratio of greater than one. And uh, there was a little bit overlap with benign lesions uh, overlapping on the malignant lesions, but overall there's a very good uh, separation of the distribution between benign and malignant. Another interesting thing that uh, we have reported is that uh, on some vendors uh, strain system there's a very unique artifact which uh, we've named the bullseye artifact um, and this occurs in cystic lesions and here you can see a simple cyst and the bullseye artifact is composed of three um, components. One is a black ring with a white inner dot and then a distal white dot. And the combination of these three things is actually extremely uh, significant in determining if something is a benign cyst. Um, we did a, a study in evaluating this artifact, um, and the bullseye artifact had perfect sensitivity, specificity, and a positive predictive value in determining the pathology proven benign cystic lesions. This is seen in both simple as well as complicated benign cysts. Um, if the artifact in our series could have been used to exclude lesions from biopsy, our biopsy rate would have um, changed from um, 47.3 to 63.4%, uh, which is uh, statistically significant. Our positive biopsy rate would have increased from 27% to 36%, and again, which was um, statistically significant. When, one of the things we were very concerned about uh, when we uh, did this was would we miss any cystic neoplasms. And this is the uh, smallest lesion that we could find and this was a uh, introductal papilloma but within this uh, cyst there's a two millimeter solid papilloma within the cyst and you can see that on the elastography we can clearly see that the uh, papilloma shows up as a defect within the cyst artifact and we know that this is a solid component within this cyst. Uh, this is another interesting case that I think uh, describes uh, how to interpret these images and things to be aware of when you're interpreting images. Um, this was a patient that came in for a screening mammogram that had a suspicious lesion. Uh, on ultrasound, we can see this relatively isoechoic lesion that corresponded to the mammographic abnormality. And uh, what I've done on the B-mode images, I kind of say that this patient had a head to her lesion, which I've circled in red, a body of the lesion, and then a small tail that I have in the green area here uh, on the lesion. When we look at the elastogram, the, the main body of the lesion was hard, and it got larger, suspicious for a malignancy. 
The tail also is gotten larger, again suspicious for malignancy. However, the head of the lesion is now uh, actually extremely soft and we don't really see the lesion. Um, and on pathology, this body and tail turned out to be uh, an invasive ductal cancer and what was the head uh, was actually a benign fibroadenoma. So here again, we, we have seen in many cases now what we thought was one lesion on B-mode imaging actually turns out to be two lesions. And you have to be aware that most pathologists will not tell you what additional benign lesions are present in the specimen uh, when they go to surgery. Um, so you often don't know unless you go down and actually have the pathologist relook uh, to see this. And again, this can be a compounding factor when you're interpreting lesions and looking at the length measurements because if the lesions are very similar in size and you do not identify that, you may get um, false uh, negative results. Uh, let's move on to um, strain imaging using ARFI. So in addition to be using patient motion or hand motion to cause the displacement of the lesions, we can also use an ARFI push pulse, which can be used to move the tissue. So this is not shear wave imaging. Here we're using the ARFI pulse to just generate the movement in the tissue, and we use the strain algorithm to um, interpret the images. And again, what we see is, <clears throat> in these cases, that the lesion on B-mode image gets larger on the strain imaging, again, consistent with a malignancy and again, another case. Um, and this was done to see if this was less uh, user independent. Um, one of the problems that we find when using this technique is the ARFI push pulse uh, in large breasts may not cause enough displacement deep in the breast. Um, and we actually prefer to use the standard strain imaging where we uh, use patient motion to generate the displacement uh, because in, even in a large breast or a dense breast, we can get motion throughout the entire breast to get a good elastogram. Using the ARFI technique uh, in lesions that are deep or in very dense breasts, we may not get enough displacement to actually get uh, good results. Moving on to shear wave imaging. In this technique, we use a push pulse, uh, which is a very low frequency, high energy pulse uh, into the breast. And what this does is causes um, the tissue to um, vibrate. And you can think of it as the push pulse is a stone and the shear waves are the ripples when we throw the stone into the water. And what we use is conventional B-mode imaging to measure the shear wave speed. And this shear wave speed VS is proportional to the stiffness of the tissue. So the harder the tissue, the faster the shear wave travels through that uh, tissue. And in shear wave imaging, we can do uh, measurements in one small voxel, doing a point measurement, or we can use a color map over a region of interest uh, to get a uh, overview of uh, the shear wave speed uh, over a region of the breast. Again, we're going to use our Jello Phantom with the almond uh, to show you our physics. Um, here, what we do is we place our ROI. We apply our push pulse, which generates the ripples in the tissue, and those shear waves are going to move at a speed that's based on the stiffness of that tissue. And again, we're going to use our detection BMO pulses to measure that velocity. Um, showing you this in a little bit different way uh, to help you understand it, this uh, image a is our push pulse. We apply our push pulse, and then in our uh, region of interest, we're going to use standard ultrasound to measure the displacement of the tissue. And here you can see what we see on the displacement of the tissue based on the shear waves. And here you can see the one that's closer, we've got a peak that occurs faster uh, than the others, and as we get farther away from the push pulse, that peak gets farther and farther away. And then if we plotted the peak of the um, curve versus the time, the slope of this line actually is the shear wave speed. And this shear wave speed is what we're going to color code to overlay the, on the map. Um, here's some examples. This is a um, mucinous cancer. 
And here you can see that we have uh, shear wave velocities uh, within the cancer that range from approximately 80 kilopascals to 123 kilopascals. Um, this is a benign uh, fibroadenoma, and you can see that it has a, a measurement of approximately uh, 17 kilopascals. Uh, one of the problems, like we've talked about before, is that shear wave generation is depth dependent. Um, we're limited by FDA requirements of how strong that push pulse can be. And in our experience, if a lesion is deeper than four centimeters, uh, one may not obtain results. And you can try repositioning the patient to bring the lesion closer to the skin. Um, but if you can't, what you'll see is there's no color coding in this box. And this is telling you that the system did not pick up any shear waves and that this area is not interpretable uh, by the shear wave elastography. Um, there was a huge uh, trial uh, looking at shear wave elastography, the BE1 trial. Um, and what they found was that if for B3 and B4A lesions, um, shear wave imaging uh, suggests that the lesions were benign, and they used a, a kilopascal number of approximately 80 uh, to uh, distinguish between benign and malignant, um, that if it was benign, we could lower our BIRAD score by one, suggesting that we can make a B3 lesion a B2 lesion, and we can make a B4A lesion a B3 lesion. Um, and if the a shear wave was positive, uh, then we would upgrade those lesions and they would be required biopsy. And using that, the shear wave increased the specificity of ultrasound from 61% to 78% with no change in sensitivity uh, and increased the positive predictive value from approximately 54% to 67%. Um, we've noticed that there are some problems with uh, shear wave imaging in breast. Um, there are often blue cancers or soft cancers uh, that we've seen. And in our experience, approximately 50% of invasive ductal cancers either code as soft or do not code at all. Uh, they, uh, there's no color. Um, they may have a ring of high velocity surrounding the tumor. And um, again, if the shear wave is not generated in that area, it's not color coded, signaling to you that you don't get any information uh, and you can't make any decision if the lesion is benign or malignant. But unfortunately, there are several cancers that show up as being blue. Uh, this is uh, one such example. Uh, again, this was a six millimeter invasive ductal cancer. And you can see that on shear wave elastography, the lesion shows up as uh, very soft. It has a slight uh, ring of increased velocity. Um, however, it's still very low. And if we look at the strain image, you can see that the lesion increased from 6 millimeters to almost 8 millimeters, suggesting that this is a malignant lesion. And this is very concerning um, because what we really would like is on the shear wave imaging, if we get a very low number, to be really confident that the lesion is benign. Um, we've done some work in trying to decipher why this is happening. Um, and this is a case of an invasive ductal cancer, and this is one that has a, uh, a ring around it of high velocity. Um, and I'm showing you here the shear waves that are generated um, as we do this test. And you can see that if we look in the peritumoral area where we're getting these high signals, um, we have these waveforms that have a little bit of noise, but we can still identify the peaks reasonably well to get accurate measurements. However, if we look at what the shear waves look at within the tumor itself, we basically see there's a lot of displacement, but it's all noise. And the problem with us coding this as soft is that the algorithm is interpreting this noise as a um, slow shear wave speed. And um, this is a fixable problem in that the algorithms need to be modified so that when we see this uh, noise pattern, that they do not color code the lesion as being soft, but again, color code it black so we know that we really can get an accurate measurement. And uh, one vendor has uh, done this, and you can see here's another blue cancer, uh, soft cancer, if you will, but they've now generated a quality map. 
And what this quality map does is tell us what is the uh, quality of the shear waves. And we've here used a green, yellow, red map where green is a very good shear wave, meaning go, it's good to interpret that, and red means the shear waves are poor and shouldn't be interpreted. And here you can see that although we've got a low shear wave velocity in the tumor, the quality map is telling us it's red. Do not believe that data. Uh, one of the things that we have found uh, to be the most um, problematic of why people who start with elastography are not getting good results is something called pre-compression. Um, and elastography uh, obviously looks at how these uh, forces are change, change when we apply them to the breast. But the elasticity properties of these tissues change when they're compressed. So in other words, if we have something and we apply a lot of pressure, it becomes stiffer. And um, therefore, we end up getting inaccurate results. Um, and I, I kind of say this is the heavy hand. So if you're doing your breast ultrasound and you're using a heavy hand and pushing on the breast, you're changing the elastic properties and you're making softer tissues hard. And what we have found was that by applying a, a significant amount of pre-compression, and women at this point say this is less compression than on a mammogram, you can actually make fat have the same uh, elasticity properties as a breast cancer. So you really need to be doing these exams with a minimal touch. Uh, here's an example of what happens. Um, this actually is an invasive ductal cancer. And again, it's one of these. And actually, there's a little, you can see that there's really no coding here. So we know that this is uh, probably inaccurate results. But as we apply compression and we're pushing on the breast, you can see that we're making the velocities much higher. And what I like to do to decide how much pre-compression I'm doing is if we look at this Cooper's ligament, you can see, um, let's do with a lot of pre-compression, here's our Cooper's ligament at this depth. As I lift up the probe, we can see that this is falling deeper and deeper into the far field. So I'm lifting up the probe and I'm releasing the pressure from the breast. And I use this all the time when I'm doing elastography, that I stop before I do my elastogram. I look at something, be it a rib in the far field or a Cooper's ligament, and I lift up the probe, and I do this until I can get whatever I'm looking at to far, fall as far in the far field as possible and still get a reasonable image. When you do this, your B-mode image will, quality will suffer, but again, you're doing this for your elastography, and to get good elastography results, oftentimes your B-mode image is going to suffer, and you should be doing uh, your B-mode image separately to get the high-quality B-mode image separately than uh, doing when you do the elastogram. Um, and just, this is again, just going over what I said, pick an object in the far field, be it a rib, a Cooper's ligament, lift the probe up, and that object will start to fall in the far field, and you continue to do this uh, until you still have contact. And uh, I like to grade the amount of compression based on, as I drop this here a rib, uh, without compression it goes to four centimeters depth. If I apply some pre-compression it goes to three centimeters, then I like to say we've applied a 25% pre-compression. And again, we should be doing our elastography, either strain or shear wave, uh, with as close to zero uh, pre-compression as possible. Again, this is uh, the results of our study, and here you can see different tissues. And as we apply different amounts of pre-compression, everything begins to increase in velocity, so that at an approximately 40% pre-compression, even fat has the same velocities as cancers. Uh, just to show you, these are the shear waves uh, and to show you what happens as we apply pre-compression. So here is no pre-compression and again you can kind of think here's your slope the, the, as we move away from the shear wave the peak occurs later and we get less and less amplitude but as we apply pre-compression you can see that we're moving all these peaks uh, closer and closer in time. So we're getting faster and faster shear wave velocities. 
This is to show you uh, what happens with um, strain imaging. Um, and what we have found, if you apply minimal pre-compression, and here I'm using this rib, here what we have at about two centimeters, we really get a very good elastography of this uh, epidermoid cyst. Um, here, if we're at about 1.7 uh, centimeters in depth and we're applying mild pre-compression, we don't get as quite a good of elastogram. And what we notice is on the frame-to-frame -frame differences, we get some lesions that are... Um, good images and then some that are bad. And if we apply significant pre-compression here, we're at about 1.3 centimeters in depth, that all we get is noise and we really cannot get a good elastogram. And again, the same thing happens with shear wave. Um, here we're looking at a simple cyst done correctly with very minimal pre-compression. And as, add we, as we add more and more compression, and again, here you can see by this rib getting closer and closer, to the skin, we can see that we've made this cyst now look like it's a cancer. So again, you should be doing all your elastography with very little pre-compression. So to summarize uh, what we see, the differences between strain and shear wave imaging, um, strain imaging, we don't really have a problem with depth. So as long as we can get a good B-mode image, we can get good results. With uh, shear wave imaging, we've got the problem that the shear wave only penetrates so deep. And that's usually around four centimeters. It may be less in a patient that's got a very dense breast. So uh, you are going to have problems with deep lesions in the breast. You can try moving the patient so that the lesion is closer to the skin, uh, but this um, is still usually problematic. Pre-compression is really a big problem with both strain and shear wave imaging. And no matter what elastography you're doing, you need to apply the least amount of pre-compression as possible. Um, in our hands, if we look at sensitivity, is the lesion a cancer? Uh, we find that strain imaging is very, very good, and um, it's definitely greater than 99% sensitive. Um, and that size change, which I must say only occurs in breast, uh, is uh, a very strong indicator of a malignancy. Um, because of presently with the algorithms that are used in shear wave imaging, we have this problem with the softer blue cancers that you need to be aware of. Um, so we're a little bit less um, sensitive at this point in time with shear wave imaging. Um, and again, hopefully that will improve as the manufacturers improve their algorithm. If we look at specificity, is it benign? Um, we often have a problem in strain imaging because most benign lesions have very similar elastic properties to normal dense breast tissue. And oftentimes it's very difficult to get a good length measurement because the lesion actually blends in with the normal tissue. Um, where on shear wave imaging, um, this is kind of the best case that shear waves occur very easily in uh, the softer tissues and we get good measurements. So um, we think the specificity of shear wave imaging is better than that of strain. If you want a quantitative measurement, uh, we can do the semi-quantitative ratios uh, to get a relative ratio of a lesion to something else, such as fat in the image, but we really can't get a absolute measurement. Um, on shear wave imaging, we actually do get that absolute measurement. And um, we have found that bullseye artifact has been uh, a tremendous help for us in clinical practice because we have found many lesions, even those that we thought were solid, turned out to be benign, complicated cysts. And we find a large number of isodense uh, complicated cysts uh, that are lesions that you may see on um, MR or maybe even palpable um, that you normally would not see on uh, B-mode imaging. And again, we find that extremely useful on shear wave imaging. Um, in very simple cysts, shear waves do not propagate and you will not get color, but in most complicated cysts, there is shear wave prop propagation, and you will get a low reading, but you will not really be able to tell if it's a cyst or solid. So to conclude, both strain and shear wave imaging provide additional information on breast lesion characterization. Uh, we believe that elastography should be part of the routine breast exam uh, uniformly. Uh, both techniques have advantages and disadvantages. 
um, and the disadvantages of one technique are the advantages of others. Um, and we really like the combination of strain and shear wave imaging. Um, and it's really satisfying to us clinically when we get the same results on strain and shear wave imaging uh, to really increase our confidence that we're getting accurate results. Um, here are, are just some references. Uh, we'll give you a little bit of time to have those. And I do just want to end by saying, uh, at the time of this lecture, the FDA has not approved any quantification of elastography in the United States. And this includes the strain ratio, which we've talked about in the comparison of a lesion stiffness to background tissue of fat, uh, or to display the shear wave velocities uh, that I've used in this talk. Thank you.